Joining me now on the Next Film School podcast, a returning guest who I have not had the pleasure of speaking with in uh, in far too long. Not like she's been doing anything. She's been sitting at home twiddling her her thumbs. Exactly. Um, I don't. I should have asked this before. I, I don't even know. Like what it, it? I should. There's probably a longer list of things that you are not associated with at this point. She's one of the faces of the NBA. She's one of the faces of the Knicks. Uh, Monica McNutt. Hello. Macri, what up? It's good to be with you. Oh, sorry, I'm taking a sip of my iced coffee. It's been that kind of a day. It's been that kind of a week. Um, it's funny. I thought Knicks, no more Knicks basketball things would get like lighten up and I'd be like less exhausted. But no, that's not, not quite. I not get quite. it. <laughs> I totally um, get it. <laughs> yeah, I know you get it. Uh, I, you know what? Let's let's start there. We'll talk about the Knicks in a minute. Um, I have a little tradition. I feel like when you come on to to indulge me in, in talking about you for a bit because um i mean i had the pleasure of like getting to know you a little bit and and starting like our dialogue when you were mostly just on msg and like a couple other things and now here we are and it's like you turn on national tv nba game and like oh there's monica which is like <laughs> it's you know i got you know i, I could serve us friends a bit like I, I it's surreal for me i can imagine how your close friends and family feel let alone how you feel so I just want to start off and ask you, like, how how has the year been for you? How has the season? Woo, Macri, ha. Uh, let's see. Player comp from this year for me. <laughs> um, I probably would go. I feel like Josh Hart is too high praise. But, like, I'm there in terms of energy level, like energy exerted. Too high praise for you or too high praise for Josh Hart? For me, like as I reflect on this year, um, I've I've called it like a big time year of growth, right? Um, I got some choices to kind of sit down and make here in this offseason in terms of how I want this path to play out. I'm really proud that I've had the opportunity to try a bunch of different things, including calling games. Um, But we kind of got to figure out what is going to be the best fit moving forward, if I may. By the way, you... you I don't know what the we was in reference to. Congratulations. I have not spoken oh, to you. Oh, thank you. The news. <laughs> it's, it feels like yesterday. I'm actually, I have a picture of, of my wife and I, like from like right before we got engaged on my desk that always, I always look at and it's a, it's a cool time. It's a special, it's yeah. a special time. It's a time of a lot of excitement. Anyway. Besides um, the wedding industry, just like it's crazy. But other than that, it's great. And we're super excited. <laughs> who's, who's doing the planning? Uh, we have a planner who's amazing, who's literally been my lifesaver because I could not ever imagine trying to plan a wedding in the midst of a season. Uh, yeah, no. When you when you have a lot of other responsibilities, it's 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 kind of hard. Um, I, I, I yes. Uh, <laughs> what? So obviously, your, I mean, your profile has risen a lot. I, I have to ask, like, has there been anything that has been? surprising about that anything that's been hard about that i mean i'm sure like you know you go out and like get a cup of coffee you go to the gym you go wherever you're gonna go and it's like oh people like are reacting to you i would imagine differently than they were probably were a few years ago like what, what's what's that been like um first of all knicks fans have shown love since i got here right like i have acc- acclimated to them calling my name out of love and it sounds just like i owe somebody some money like i've, I've adjusted <laughs> to that like i'm like what's up how you doing like go knicks <laughs> fully acclimated to that part of it. Um, I will say, I think this year, I think games, like doing national games was uh, a, a challenge that I'm up for, but it, it was a different type of muscle. Um, so How I so? think in that, like, like ESPN went through a transition with Mark Jones, I'm not, excuse, yeah, Mark Jackson, excuse me, and Jeff Van Gundy, yeah. right? Like, these are the creme de la creme. Um, and so I think that was a, a, um, let's see, what's the word I want to use? That was a little bit of a wake up call in terms of like doing that well. Like while games are what got me into the industry, I haven't called games consistently in a while, right? And so to feel like you have done that in a way that you did the game and the players, everybody service, like, and there's a lot of eyeballs on games. Like that was a new experience too in terms of like all the time, all the feedback, not just Twitter, nobody's, but even like your bosses, right? Like there's a lot of eyeballs on games. So that was a big time. Um, opportunity. And like I said, I got to sit with and, and figure out what I want to do moving forward. Um, I'm not, I wouldn't say that I'm deterred, but that was, it was just different. I, for a long time, Macri, as this meteoric rise has unfolded, I have legit said to my loved ones and my agents and folks close to me, like, 
I don't think that I'm bad, but I don't know that I'm that good. So let me, where can I get the constructive feedback, right? Like it's the, it's the inner athlete in you, right? Like coach me up and boy, it gives us an opportunity to get coached up. So <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Was, did you find that there was a push and pull? Cause you have an unmistakable style and just way about you that, I mean, it's, it's what makes you, it's why you are where you are. Did you find a push and pull between like, not like wanting to stay true to that, but just like being yourself versus I've been watching people call games for a long time. I, I like, this is kind of the quote unquote way you're supposed to do it. Did you ever feel any tension between those two things? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I think too, like, and shout out to my bosses and leadership who gave me the opportunity, but there was no, like, this is what we expect. And actually I give Mike Breen a ton of credit because before I did the games with the Knicks, Mike and I went to breakfast and we had an opportunity to talk and like I did the two with Mike and did the two with Kenny Albert. And that was very helpful. But by that point I had already done a handful of them for ESPN. Um, and so, yeah, like that seat is true to, I'm going to teach you and explain. And I, <laughs> Had to be reminded of that, right? Because there, I'm a little bit more like, oh my God, you see that? Like, and so <laughs> it, it, it's just, Macri, it's kind of crazy to be going through the ebbs and flows of your career. All good things. Please don't get me wrong. All good things. But in front of, you know, 800,000, a million people, like, you know what I mean? Like, it's just, woo. No, it's, I mean, look, I don't, I don't want to get completely sidetracked here. I, it's, like so, for instance, like it, it's like one one hundredth of the scale of where you're at. But like Nick's film school gets bigger. Like I get more exposure, which is great, and like we, it helps like support my my family now. Like that's all wonderful. But at the same time, it opens up to all sorts of criticism. That like once upon a time when I was sitting on my couch just talking to twenty five people watching me on like Periscope, I could say whatever the hell I wanted. And if right. I slipped and I did something or said something that was like not the right thing to say, it was like all right, well. Who cares? Nobody, nobody heard it, you know. And now, you know, things change. But that's a, that's a good that's a good thing to to have happen. I, I would guess for you. Yeah, I agree. I mean, like I said, I've called it a year of growth, and I think the beauty of it for me is like, and my big thing, Macri, anybody that talks to me career wise or professionally, like I'm very deliberate in building a life and not just a career. And so the career piece has to fit with the life piece. And I am so fortunate to have, you know a handful of options sitting in front of me and I kind of get to decide, um, of course, with counsel and wisdom of folks that I trust and, you know, um, but I get to kind of decide. So it's, I'm in a good spot. I'm really excited. Well, I'm excited to to hear which way you, you wind up leading. Um, and, and I'll, I'll just leave it. I'm sure it's going to be, I, I have a feeling we're going to see more of you and not less of you. That would be the, <laughs> That would be the that would be the 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 limb that I'm gonna go out on, and and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, let's talk about this this basketball season, which you were, which you were a prominent part of. Like you said, you you know you called games. Obviously, you were around the Knicks a lot. Um, we have what is it Friday? So it's five days removed from the end of it. Uh, again, kind of start off like general. How you, how do you feel about the season in retrospect? Like what's your what's your dominant emotion like i had fred katz on the other day and he was like i think the team is disappointed like how would you you when you think when you're thinking about this year maybe not as a whole because i think we could all agree it was a good season but like how do you feel about it about the way it ended maybe i guess is the best way to ask it the way it ended the first word that only honestly comes to mind for me is sad yeah um it was tough <laughs> watching the og shuffle oh, it man. was tough Watching JB first go to the bench to talk to Rick, and you're like, that's not a good sign. Um, and then, of course, the news comes down, right? Uh, it was tough. And I I like John Halliburton. I like Tyrese Halliburton just as an NBA player. But it was tough watching him skip around the floor. Um, it was tough. Like, the, the, the very end was kind of sad because you are left so much with what if. What if you could have just not even healthy, full on healthy, but what if you could have finished the series with the people that started the series? I, I don't know if this is true for you. And I said it the night the season ended game three is what I'm always going to go back to. And the fact that they had a, whatever, I think it was a nine point lead mid like early on in the fourth quarter, but like still you had a nine point lead and you, your defense was good enough from that point forward. And then if they win that game, you say, all right, well, OG gets more time thrust up. Brunson never breaks his hand. And I got to even go a step further. 
you know, game two in in um, Boston, Indiana was last night. And I know the Celtics are up 2-0. But like watching this Boston team, I, well, let's t- take a step aside from the Knicks for a second. Like, I don't know. I've watched the Celtics the last couple of games. And I'm like, man, you're telling me we couldn't have got in there with a healthy, o- even without a healthy OG and maybe stole one in the in Boston. Like that, it, it makes it that much harder. For- yeah, I was I was there. So I'm with you. <laughs> I was <laughs> yeah. like, oh, OK, I'm at the garden and it's not the Knicks playing. I had to take commercial air f- travel and like didn't get to hop on the team playing like <laughs> Um, yeah, I, listen, I, I got to a point though, as you continue to lose bodies, it was like, I don't want to watch them limp through that in the Eastern Conference Finals because they deserve better, right? They deserve a legitimate shot to go out there and compete. And so I think that is probably the sour end of it. But unfortunately, knock on wood, right? Like injuries are a part of the game. Um, and I was quite upset at the national conversation around Tibbs and minutes, like y'all gotta be kidding me right now. Uh, and I can, think can we that, can we stay on that for a minute, Monica? Are we allowed to stay on that for a minute? We can stay on that. <laughs> so, who was it? It was Josh Hart, the, the the your comp, right? Your comp, who was asked about? I forget when he was asked about Tibbs, and his his first words out of his mouth were, "The people are who are saying whatever they're saying are not in our locker room. They are not around us." You are around this team. You are around them as much as anyone. So can you please, I'm just going to give you the floor. Can you like, what what do the outsiders not see when it comes to Tibbs and the kind of culture they have here of uh, that has players wanting to be out on the floor as much as they are? First of all, Tibbs playing guys in, in no way any type of crutch, like none of that, right? He is playing guys because he is constantly trying to win. The beauty of this locker room is that you have guys that are constantly trying to win. I think what is lost in the minutes logged is the preparation that is incessant when it comes to Tibbs is the way that these guys trust him to have them prepared and the way that they digest the game plan. Right. When you look at Josh, Isaiah Hardenstein, um, Precious to a, a little bit of a lesser degree, but Dante DiVincenzo, like they are all coming off of their best years under the leadership of head coach Tom Thibodeau, Jalen Brunson. How dare I not mention him, right? And so this is a perfect meeting of the minds in terms of a coach that wants everything he can get out of you in the name of competition and improvement. And guys, oh, I don't know, three of them only won national championships in college that understand in order to max out, there are no shortcuts. Could Tibbs have stolen four minutes a game maybe for Alec Burks? Possibly, but let's not be naive, right? For role players, first of all, we know that rotation usually don't go past eight, but eight and nine, sometimes seven, you got about 90 seconds to make a positive impact or he's going to what he knows. And we watched Alec Burks down the stretch of the regular season outside of Sacramento, didn't show up in that limited amount of time. Bojan Bogdanovic, yo-yo with those minutes, didn't show up in that limited amount of time. But when he started to show up, he was on the floor. And so it is a very much results-driven space, right? And so... The minutes that Josh Hart had to log, the minutes that Jalen Brunson has had to log, even Dante DiVincenzo, people, the team lost an all-star, an all-NBA guy. And then the big piece of the trade was not available for a month down the stretch. Like, how do you want to win? Are you clocking minutes or are you trying to get these Ws? Like, it's very simple for me. And I guess that's the part that I always come back to is like people will, a lot of the same media people who you are talking about driving the conversation about Thibodeau. I feel like those are a lot of the same people that praise that have praised the turnaround, the cultural, uh, you know, 180 in New York and the fact that it's, it is all about winning and the fact that it's, it's a serious locker room now where, you know, we both know that was not always the case. Well, how are you, how are you supposed to have that if you are then at the same time sending a message to your guys like, well, this guy's not bringing it. And look, it's nothing against Alec Burks. We all watched Alec Burks come into these games. He was sticking up it the joint. Huge. Or, it was not oh, good. Right. So we'll how are you? That. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't know what what message that's sending. If you're like, yeah, he, he stinks, but, we're, you know, we got to get our we, we can't have certain players get over certain minutes. So what are we going to do? It's it, it bothered me as well. I'm obviously a big tips fan. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I'm happy that's kind of over with. Um, in terms of the, well, let's stick with the culture part of it this season. Did you sense, because it was a it was a roller coaster. They made the OG trade, and it felt like there was one season before that. 
And then they had January, and that was a whole thing. And then it was after January 27th. Like, could you kind of take me through how the se- how you view the season as far as the like where how they got from point A to to the to the finish line? Like, did it feel like multiple seasons in one to you? Um, I would give you two, probably two and one healthy and then not healthy, though. I know that kind of okay. skips over the trade, but that's kind of how I compartmentalize. No, that's, it. that's what I want to know. Um, I actually think when you look at this year, you got to go back to last year a little bit, right? Like the Miami fiasco, if you want to call it that, you come up short, whatever. But you saw a team pulling in the right direction. You saw the beginning of the foundation being laid. You saw glimpses of what Jalen Brunson could be. Um, and I think in December, it's, it's a little stagnant, right? Like it, it, it gotten a little bit stagnant. It was like, all right, is this team better than last year's group? Like, did they benefit from some fortuitous bounces that they could control last year? Like, whatever. Um, and then the trade happens. And I know there's a strong contingent of Knicks fans that were so sad to see Emmanuel quickly go. I being one of them, like I love quick. I love his family. Um, but at the same time, on the business level, he's not going to be the starting point guard in New York. So you got to deal with that. Right. You just got to deal with that. Um, and so I think everybody was really excited about OG and Obi. And I remember the precious part kind of going under the radar. But at that point, you were like, OK, at least he's a legitimate four. Like he's a legit four. The productivity scale may shift at times, but he is a legitimate four. And then I, re- I heard all the jokes about going back to go get those guys out of Detroit. But both of them at their peak and at their best snipers. Right. Like so. Think forward to the best possible scenario. Um, and then we have January. And I know Pat and I at points are looking at each other like, is this is this real? Is this happening? Is this legit? Um, because there was a coalescence, not just in the trade, but even Julius, before he got injured, to me, was playing better basketball. I know Katz, you had him on the pod recently. He's talked a lot about his kill spots and streamlining his game. I love the version of Julius Randle that is th- three dribbles or less. Like, boom, make a decision, use your strength. Let's rock. We're not doing a whole bunch of dancing and, you know what I'm saying, spinning around. And you had gotten to that. You saw a team where guys started to very clearly understand their role. And then you get to the end of January, right? Um, And I think the second part of the season with the unhealthy squad, the light could not have been brighter on Jalen Brunson. And I think I remember watching Jay Wright talking to the Inside the NBA guys. And even I think even he admitted that, like, I knew he's a winner. I know that he's going to work. But what he's doing now, blowing folks' minds, right? Um, And so that was fun to to watch. And what I thought was so underrated about the second part of the season, even with the ebbs and flows, I think they might have hung around 500 when Jalen was really your only shot creator consistently. But ultimately, you finish out with the 50 wins and you get the second seed. But what I thought was underrated over the course of that run was the organizational understanding. For as much as the stats are going to tell you, Jalen had to pound the rock. He was running ISO. He was the slowest paced team in the league. Everybody understood what they was doing. Jay Beagle had a ball. Josh gonna crash the glass. Isaiah Hartstein gonna crash the glass. He might give you this backdoor pass from the top of the key on occasion. Like, not to DiVincenzo OG when he was healthy, they gonna space the floor, they gonna knock down threes. Like, to me, that is such an underrated piece of success in terms of understanding exactly what we do well and how to do it. And so I think you gotta give everybody around JB the credit as well, particularly Deuce McBride, because there were some moments where he was thrust into it and he was demonstrated the utmost level of preparation and professionalism and his minutes yo-yo that points down the stretch of the back half of the season. So to me, this group enjoying one another, being very clear on how they are put in the best position to win and nobody fighting to be, you know, one, two guy, whatever, like the streamlined piece of it to me was so very important. And I don't want anybody listening to this and be like, what you trying to say, Jew? No, because even when Jew was healthy this year, I thought he took great leaps and bounds, again, to streamline and play clean, crisp basketball. But when it did become Jalen Brunson or bust, nobody had any questions about that. I want to, I want to pick up on a few of those things. So start with Jalen. Um, this may, may be too obvious, but I, I'm going to ask it anyway. How much do you think the fact that the once Julius went out and once OG went out, the second and third... I don't know if you would call them best players on the team, most important players on the team were Jalen's college roommates. How much do you, you know, call, whatever, college teammates, uh, podcast hosts, co-hosts, yes, roommates, podcast, the, whole, the whole thing. How much do you think that 
played into the thing that you were just talking about where everybody kind of fell in line and nobody, you know, everybody, you know, it's like everybody understood, like, this is how we're going to play. This is our best chance to win right now. Uh, let's just go do it. I mean, on a percentage scale, right? Like, that's probably 70% of it, right? Although, every time Tim's was asked about that, he's kind of like, these guys have been in the league for six, seven years. And so that was a long time ago. But yes, there is institutional knowledge and understanding there. Um, I would go as high as like 70%, right? But even in that, Josh Hart is 100% committed to his body and his craft. Dante DiVincenzo, shoot or shoot to get hot, baby, and shoot or shoot to stay hot. We said that all year on the radio. He's going to let that thing fly. Like, in their own, they are bona fide NBA players. And so they get it, right? Um, but, yeah, I, I would probably throw it up in terms of 70%. Like, that's your core. And they set the tempo uh, in terms of culture, and they did that. I'm going to ask you one more about Jalen because he – is so damn good in front of a microphone and he gives, I mean, he's like, it's like if you put Tibbs in front of a mic, you're essentially going to get the same answers when you put Jalen in front of a mic. Do you, do you think he enjoyed this? I'll, I'll ask it that way. I, I, as opposed to like, like in Jalen's perfect world, like how many shots do you think he's like, do you think he loved putting up this many shots? Do you think he'd rather put up like last, like what, what, what like peer into his mind for a minute for me? So I, I actually asked him this. I asked him specifically about shot count. But when we did the thing with DoorDash, where we went inside the tapes, I did ask him. I don't think it made the cut. And he's like, yeah, like, of course, winning is fun for one. But he also is a competitor, right? And so, yes, he was having fun. Here's where I think, like, the big picture does get it a little bit misconstrued. While Jalen opened a ton of eyes, second team All-NBA, all All-Star selection, deserving of all the praise that he got. His desire to win and his basketball IQ, he could take 10 less shots and be good if it meant he was kicking the ball to somebody that was leading his team to win. And I think that needs to be understood. Like every now and again, you'll hear the tenor of ball hug, especially on, you know, socials, whatever. But again, you got to watch this team. There's a way that they have to do it. And I think, Jalen, there are moments that he would take a shot or two back, right? Like he hasn't always been perfect. But I think if whatever happens this summer, or even if Julius Randle is healthy, right? Like Jalen does not have to be that dominant. Jalen has to lead the way to win, whatever that looks like. Yeah, and he'll and I, you obviously you get this like if they, I don't, we don't need to start throwing around names, but if they trade for some kind of you know mega star tomorrow, like and Jalen next year is is taking like you said to five ten less shots. I, I can't imagine ten less shots a game, but like fewer shots a game. He he'd be fine with that. Um. I want to talk about Julius because you just brought him up and it's been unsurprisingly, he's been a, a center of conversation since the season ended in terms of, well, this is going to be a big summer and obviously Julius is extension eligible and he could make an awful lot of money. Um, how, how confident are you? Not that like, like the, 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 the notion that like this team is like better off with Julius Randall is utterly ridiculous. But but how how confident are you? Because they definitely tapped into more ball movement, more player movement, more. There was a, a greater flow to the offense after, you know, after Julius went out. But that was by necessity. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they weren't as good. And the numbers show that they weren't winning as many games. The offense wasn't as good. And I it, so like are, how I maybe not how confident are you? How excited are you? To see Julius, let's assume they don't make some massive trade, which would send a, a major piece out. How excited are you to see Julius back with this this group next year? Julius, to me, can do what Isaiah wanted to do. If you give me Julius back, top of the key, handoff as, as a hub, handoff screens. Pick your poison if it's Julius Randle and Jalen Brunson in the pick and roll. Like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? The pick and pop. Now, and this is where I think you got to give Julius credit. He's a student of the game, right? If he's watching the way, and obviously with Tibbs and the preparation, if he's watching those spots where Isaiah had maybe the idea but misstep on the actual execution, and he sees the power of being able to be this, this hub, and then also you're still a guy that draws two, and again, playing decisive through dribbles or less basketball, Sign me up. Like, sign me up. E I, even if we just go back to Indiana, Macri, right? Pascal Siakam, I think he's having a great postseason run, right? He's wiry. He's shifty. If he got a guard, Julius Randle, 
That's energy. Tap that energy. You know what I'm saying? Like, and so I think it on the it is easy to look and be like, oh, well, the ball moved. Wow, wow, wow. This team, first of all, they were much better this past month than they were in October. Frankly, they were a different team by construction. But even if you want to go from January to March or what, what are we, month are we in May, right? Improvement. And so I think you got to put the pieces back together and think of the ebbs and flows of a season and the opportunities to improve and to get better. It's not perfect overnight. But to me, Tibbs is foundational thing. We all know you need a guy that can draw two. So you give me two guys that can draw two, and then you I'm willing to see what happens with the ball popping the way that we just saw this team moving and Dante DiVincenzo, Josh Hart cutting, and if that if Isaiah Hartenstein is on the floor, even give me Mitchell Robinson healthy back, right? So there are things that they had to do out of necessity that I think still translate if you get Julius Randle back on the floor. The the notion that this is, and I kind of said this to, to Fred the other day, the notion that he's some sort of a piece that is like a square peg and a round hole for what they're doing is, I frankly, it just doesn't make any sense to me because when he's had to pound the rock a little bit more, my, my point is always, well, look at the other guys who were on the team when he was doing that over the years. And it wasn't exactly, it, it's not the team that they have now. And I, I think that, and, and the other thing, and, and again, I don't want to, I don't want to speak ill of, of people who are no longer here, but like the chemistry when him and with him and RJ, I, I personally, but my two cents, it was never quite there. And so even if you look at like the time before the OG trade, like between him and Brunson, like I, I felt like the OG trade kind of made it much simpler. As you said, it made it, so it was a much cleaner basketball fit. And that's not to say anything negative about RJ's basketball ability. It's about the fit we're talking about here. And you just go back to January and you watch how they played. Like this could work. And I, I, I like to your point about like, we'll make Siakam guard him. I don't know how teams are going to defend that it, again, if they could bring everybody back. I, look, I, the front office, great job this year. We obviously will all be sitting and watching and waiting to see what the decisions are. But as we have reflected, especially nationally, like, do the Knicks need another star? Hey, knock, knock. They lost an all-star. Like, how quickly we forget, right? Um, and I think the other part, too, I will say of these guys, is the culture that is now established, they want to work, they want to improve, they want to be better, right? I remember that same DoorDash piece. OG had just got here. We must have shot that first part of February into January. And Jalen was like, OG's like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm going to just keep cutting. And Jalen was like, yeah, keep doing that. Because it's 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 exactly right, right? And and again, loved RJ too. We won an Emmy together. Shout out to RJ. Our sit down, we got us an Emmy. But like, <laughs> we wanted more than standing in the corner and cutting. Yeah, OG is good yeah. standing in the corner and that. cutting, right? And it, it's just a better fit. And so I think um, I'm excited to see how this summer pans out for this group. Um, health is wealth, both as as competitive professional athletes and just in life. And I think we saw that down the stretch. But to me, if you get Julius Randle back and there are opportunities for Josh Hart to let him push ahead and train, or excuse me, Jalen Brunson to let him push ahead and transition or, or like go to a wing and space the floor, I'm pretty sure JB is good welcoming some easier baskets. Uh, he, when's the last time he got an easy basket? Okay. Hello? <laughs> Is it January? I think you could, you, know, you could count the number he's gotten on uh, on two hands since then. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it's it's really cool to see. And I don't know. I don't know that when's the last time we, we got to watch a basketball team here in New York that made as much sense mm -hmm. as this one did, in particular after the OG trade. And like, again, I, I was curious to pick your brain about this because you have like everybody who covers like the Knicks, I'm sure watches, you know, other, other teams, but you, it's your job to like, you're covering all these teams. Like you, you, you are as much knowledge about the NBA at this point as anyone like, isn't there just like a different feel you get when you're watching a team and you're like, Oh, they get it. Like they, everybody know, like you talked about understanding your role, but where you're seeing that play out possession after possession, we're like, and like the thing I've, I've kind of been thinking to myself, how many times did we take, we see a Knicks possession where we're like, oh, that was, that was a terrible shot. Like maybe something gets blown up. Somebody, you know, a screen doesn't hit or whatever. And somebody gets forced into a late clock situation, but whatever, but like, Josh Hart. <laughs> yeah. Like, okay. <laughs> and, and how many of those go in? Right. But, but, but putting aside those, it seemed like both like before the injuries and after the injuries, like this team just had 
it's not, I wouldn't even call it a formula. It's just, they just knew exactly what they needed to do and they went out and do it and, and did it. And I, I just don't think that there's that many teams that did it as consistently as the Knicks did this year. I think that's fair. And what I will say, as I reflect, there were plenty of teams that were more talented on paper. Sure. And the one thing, the one thing that you do hear reverberate nationally that I am glad to hear, the Knicks just going to outwork you. And that might be so simple, but it is effective and it is profound. And it allowed them to win basketball games. Like, they're just going to outwork you. They're going to get to the glass. They're going to play defense. They're going to be physical. And you might have a more glamorous, sparkly roster, but the chances that your team was going to outwork the Knicks was slim to none. And I would say that even applied in this Pacer series. I don't think that they got outworked. They got outbodied, literally, because they were losing the battle of attrition, right? Um, and frankly, and I think Carlisle will tell you as much because he said it prior to game seven, the Knicks taught the Pacers how to compete in game one versus the Celtics versus the Celtics. No. Oh. That's a good one. That's a he, great I mean, call. He didn't say that, obviously, after game one. But prior to game seven, he talked yeah. about his team growing up in that series. That Come on. Come on, Macri. Come on, Pacers fans. Like, I'm not even trying to be shady right now. But the level, like, outside of TJ McConnell, everybody else had to level up in terms of intensity and toughness. And Carl, I'm not making that up. Carlisle said it. And if you look at it, you can see it. That's the thing that I guess, I don't know if it makes me feel better, but... The Knicks didn't. Knicks didn't get beat by a bad team. Like the, the, it, it's not like oh there were holes in the Pacers' defense that the Knicks just didn't exploit. Like they were, they were going out there and doing what they could do to try to exploit the Pacers' defense. The Pacers stepped up their game. I think in particular, like we know they're a great offense. That goes without saying. They, st- I thought they really stepped up their game defensively over the course of the series. And again, I, 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 I hate the Pacers. I'm sorry. I just freaking. <laughs> So you're you're not old and weathered like me from the nineties and the, I get you know. it. I get it. Yeah, it's it, it's it's not fun to lose to that team. Um a, a couple more and then I'm gonna get you out of here. I all right, we've talked a, a lot about the the culture and and kind of how, how they go about doing things here. my perhaps my biggest question for this summer, because like look, whether it's a massive trade or whether it's just maybe Flipping Bogdanovich's contract, assuming they, they pick it up for someone that maybe is a little younger, maybe fits a little bit more. How much do you think they need to worry about the piece? If assuming they bring someone in, that that piece is going to blend with kind of their program versus like, well, we feel so good about what we have going on here culturally in our locker room that, you know, maybe it doesn't have to be the perfect piece, but we'll, we, we will be able to kind of indoctrinate them into what we do like that kind of push and pull. Mm. I I said this last week on air, like the culture needs to be protected. Okay. That's a good answer. Um, Now there's a couple names out there and and this is and honestly, Mikey, this is where I'm so thankful for my like career and my lens and my opportunity to shake hands. Me folks. I, I can't remember who I was talking to. I think I was talking to a player on this one. But I tossed out the question, like, you know, what percentage of guys love ball and what percentage of guys love the lifestyle? Right? Us as fans have our own thoughts. And then I'm like talking to players, right? Um, That's a thing. I can't remember exactly what percentages we land on, but that's definitely. I was about to say, what was the answer? I'm curious. I'm trying to to remember. Are we talking like 50 50? We're talking like 90. No, it was lower than 50 50. In terms of the guys that actually really love the work, it was it was lower than fifty. It was lower than fifty fifty. I can't remember. I don't okay. want to mis- misspeak now, but it was lower than fifty fifty, right? Okay. Because my whole thing was like, y'all have been talented all your lives. Like, have y'all thirteen? Oh, you going to the NBA? Like, you know what I'm saying? So at a certain point, who is still working and who's just talented? Yeah, right. That's a great. Now line. I think there is a there's a fine line between like the guys that are working and have like a healthy relationship with it that like go home to their families and like lose correctly if they if that can be a thing and then there are guys that are just like a nightmare even though they want to win right um, and so for me I say all that to say the culture needs to be protected now there's two ways you go about culture protecting in my mind you grab a guy that gets it playing 48 minutes cool let's go I'm gonna take care of my body whatever or you grab a guy that is talented enough and the team can absorb whatever maybe side effects there could be eccentricities yeah right <laughs> if the if the team is strong enough to absorb 
that's another way to go about culture protecting. But then, then for me, Macri, I'm also like, who is actually available that I want? Now, I will say well, yeah. my wish list earlier in the season, I'm still a PG fan. I don't know what that costs you. Let me be clear. I would run it back with this squad healthy. I would totally run it back with this team healthy. But uh, of the folks that the names that have been bopped around, like PG is the one that has piqued my interest the most. So uh, screw it. Let's let's end by talking about Paul George. Uh, so Paul George, notably, uh, just because I, I, I find these things interesting, is a CAA client huh? and is uh, just so happens to be very good friends with uh, Julius Randle. And as a basketball fit, like I could probably count the amount of guys on one hand, maybe need an extra finger or two who I'd be willing to tell Dante DiVincenzo, you're going to come off the bench now because this so, so, such and such player is going to start for you. Paul George would be one of the one of the very few, one of the very few who I would say that for. Um, not to say that DiVincenzo still wouldn't play a ton. He would. Uh, I wonder... I just wonder how that would go because he's a, obviously he's an unrestricted free agent and you'd have to get, I think the Clippers to play ball. Like, do you, do you think Paul George would have any interest in coming to the East that, coast? I guess is maybe that, the way it is. So that's the part I cannot answer. Right. And you're much better about LA, you know? for me. Cause I, but this is what I will say. Mark, you tell me if you're a star and you see this next team, I know. Right, like the way no. that it's the way that it's been run, like the and and again, we just talked about it. To me, Jalen Brunson is a hell of an attractive running mate to run alongside. And Julius, and, right? It's New yeah. York, like to your. Let me use your language. Like the team is legit. Second seed, fifty wins. Like put together these consecutive winning seasons. Like, come on now, in an era of like personal branding, like in New York, really? But you know, imagine you're the piece that puts them over the top. Uh, you're gonna that's that that would be a, a pretty a pretty good way to be. One thing Alan Hahn says all the time, he's like, You gotta give Melo his props because he's the only one that really wanted to do it and wanted to wear the weight of it. And now there's JB and, and Julius, but like it's 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 a heavy crown, but there it's it's a bedazzled, not bedazzled, bejeweled, really rich crown, wealthy crown, worthy crown. It it's a it's a good crown, but and the other thing that I think I've reflected on a lot more this season, because I was hard on Melo towards the end there and I'm okay admitting that i was hard on him uh unfairly so uh i'm okay admitting that now like again there's no way to sugarcoat it the organization was kind of a disaster for a lot of the time that Melo was here and like it's still hard to play in new york but you look at what they have going on there from now from top to bottom and it's like it's it's wild for me to say that they're as well run an organization now as i think there is in the league and i think just that matters so much so when you're talking about again offseason moves and potentially bringing someone in it makes me sitting here like i have a lot of confidence that whatever the, and i can't there's not been a lot of years i could say this that whatever they're going to do this summer i feel confident it's going to work out maybe that's naive of me but like do you do you think that is naive or you think i have, I I have some pretty now, good yeah let me answer i don't think it's naive of you but i also am not as grizzled as you right like knicks fans have shown me mad love it's my Fourth season, the fourth season covering the team. Uh, so, like, I don't necessarily have the scar tissue you do, but I'm in. <laughs> like, I'm in. I trust. I think if past success is an indication of future success, you're in good hands. I love it. Um, last thing for you. Uh, I'm going to, I hate to do this, but I am going to make it a, a non Knicks question. Okay. Uh, what has been your coolest moment? Or maybe it's maybe it maybe it'll turn out being a next question. I don't know. What was your coolest moment from uh, from this year? All right, that's easy. We're in Golden State. One of the four games that I got to call. The second one with Mike Breen, Deuce McBride, Heater, ba ba ba, something bang like on the call. And I literally looked and was like, I, I, "Am I sitting next? What's what 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 alternate universe am I in right now?" Like, <laughs> like I was like, "Oh my god!" Like. He, I'm sitting right here. He just did a bang. Like, this is so dope. Oh, my goodness. Easy. Easily was the moment. That's great. Um, and then I will say, not Knicks related, All-Star this year was a lot of fun. And I, I think sometimes when you're with the team locally, you see All-Star and you're like, yo, I just want to break. But, like, we had a lot of fun in Indy. Indy was a lot of fun. The court was really cool. Like, all the guests were super dope. We cut up on the broadcast with Ryan Rucco and Richard Jefferson like we always do. So that was a lot of fun. Don't let uh... – 
Don't let Josh Hart uh, hear you say he had a lot of fun in Indy because we know he has some very true. Very true. He already, look, when I got back, because I think we were in, the team was in Philly and I had a sideline game and I think it was game three, Bucks, Pacers, the overtime game, Tyrese won. Uh, oh, Tyrese yeah, yeah. Water. So I posted, I had to post that dress. My stylist sent the dress, whatever. It was a good picture. Posted the uh, post-game interview. Josh, he's like, oh, you back from enemy lines? I'm like, bro, I have a job. Like, I get on the bus. Chico, the trainer's like, mom, you sure you don't belong on the Pacers bus? I'm like, chill, bro, chill. <laughs> That's hysterical. Um, Monica, your, your reaction, uh, I'm so happy it was caught on video at the end of game two of the Philly series, will live in my soul for all of eternity. When I when I think of that, and I was at the game, but when I think of that game, I'm going to think of your face. And, uh, and by the way, like it just a A plus 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 job, like staying composed somehow. I still don't know how you did that. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna send you off like I always do. Um, watching your your star rise is just like. It's just really, really cool from afar. And I, I, I hope I would say that even if I didn't know you, just because it's just, I mean, the, the, the world's, the world needs more Monica McNutt out there. Um, and uh, just thanks. Thanks for still taking the time. You know, really, it means a lot to us here at Next Film School. And I know everybody who, who listens as well. I appreciate y'all having me. I appreciate y'all guests and y'all previews. You, you heard me give y'all a shout out in Chicago. I was like, I heard this one, Next Film School. It's a great stat. Um, so yeah, thanks for embracing me. I, I say this all the time. Anytime I'm talking to Knicks fans, I feel the love. I greatly appreciate the love. Um, and let's keep rolling. We will keep rolling indeed. Um, ladies and gentlemen, this has been Monica McNutt. Uh, and uh, on behalf of everybody here at Knicks Film School, thanks for tuning in to another episode. We will talk to you soon. Peace out.